This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact, are you ready to book a flight? We'll take you on board and show you what flying's like out of Charlotte. I'm Sheila Saints. A new restaurant has opened in Camp North End that's bringing good food and good conversation together. We'll have that story coming up. And PBS Charlotte partners with a legendary bluegrass band to keep alive their 86 year world record. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. Flying for business or a family vacation or to visit the kids in college isn't easy anymore, not with coronavirus. Charlotte's busy airlines are a lot less busy because who really wants to wait at a crowded gate or get on a crowded jet side by side with strangers who might make you sick? So how different is flying now? Will you really feel comfortable or safe? We went looking for answers at the airport. That's where Carolina Impact's Jeff Sawyer is for now but not for long. Yeah, we're on the other side of airport security here in the main terminal at uh, Douglas Airport on our way to the gates. We're booked on four different flights to four different cities, different airlines too, just to get a feel for what it's like after all this masking and social distancing and quarantining, you know, what it's like to finally fly again. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. Our first flyaway is on American, Charlotte to Philadelphia. And it's already crowded here at the gate, but not a lot of social distancing here while we wait. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. And since it's the first flight of the day, well, at least our plane is clean. It's a deep clean that American Airlines used to do every week. Now they do it every night. Come fly with me, let's take off in the blue. Basically, we clean the same surfaces, however, we're doing it in a much more intense manner. And we've added certain um, elements to the cleaning procedure, things like the, the handles on the overhead bins that the passengers may be touching. When boarding, we ask that you maintain space between you and other customers. Meanwhile, passenger boarding here in Charlotte is kind of a free-for-all. Masks, yes, but otherwise not much different than before COVID. For this hour-long flight to Philly, my seat assignment is 18E, American putting me in a center seat, shoulder to shoulder with this stranger in 18F, which is the right side window seat, even though there are empty aisle seats all around me. Normally I either fly like Southwest or Delta, you know, someone that doesn't sell the seats. I hate that. Yeah, we're here at the uh, Philadelphia airport now, and uh, the one thing we noticed right off the bat is the social distancing here at the airport itself. Every gate here in Philadelphia has signs and spacing between the seats. Our gate in Charlotte didn't have either. Our new plane here in Philly is also scheduled for another cleaning. It's a spray and wipe down like this that American used to do every night. Now it happens every flight. And this time, from Philly, we're headed south to Florida. Flight number 43, so we're going Hello, welcome. Once again, it's another mostly full flight. And once again, American has me in the center seat. This time, I'm passenger 25E. And moments later, in the striped shirt, well, here comes passenger 25D. Oh, hi. Hi. Yep, another stranger sitting right next to me, side by side on the left even though on the right, there's a spare seat at the window that American again leaves empty. So why not leave the center seats empty instead? You know, for social distancing, like American did do until June. You're kind of raising expectations for passengers, I suppose. So this, this has been an evolving crisis, uh, and you know, we've, we've continued to adapt and evolve. I'm just wondering if it's hard to go back We'll make sure that you know we uh, we have uh, the right protocols and, and practices in place to ensure our, our, our customers and team members are safe now.
Yeah, we're here in Orlando now, not just changing planes, but uh, also changing airlines, switching from American to one of its competitors that decided not to sell the seats that American is still selling. Our Orlando flight to Atlanta is delayed by bad weather, so the Noland family passes the time watching an airport movie. Mom, daughter, and granddaughter all flying together, but uh, also keeping their distance. And so if we're supposed to be doing social distancing with the six feet, how is that happening with the middle seats being stolen? That's why the Nolans pick Delta, because every center seat on every flight is empty. And when you're traveling with a toddler, it makes a difference over other airlines. They need to take a look and re-strategize about not selling that middle seat because we want to keep everybody safe. Delta also boards its airplanes differently. Rear passengers first, and only 10 passengers at a time. So that middle aisle on your Delta plane isn't as crowded as you make your way next to that middle seat in your Delta row that isn't taken. Even basic fare passengers like me are guaranteed either an aisle seat or a window seat. Yeah, even if the flight is full out of Delta's busy hub here in Atlanta, the middle seats are empty. And even if you have to fly standby, like I do, the middle seats are still empty. Empty unless, of course, you're a family like the Nolans, who need that middle seat after a long day for a sleepy little one who's way past her bedtime. Yeah, back in Charlotte now, and uh, just wanted to point out that uh, every ticket that we uh, bought for this trip was the lowest fare available, which means it was uh, the ticket that the airline chooses your seat for you. Now, on the two uh, American flights, those seats were in the middle, side by side with strangers. But on the Delta flights, those middle seats were blocked. They were empty, which gave us a lot more room to stretch out and a lot more room for social distancing. Amy? Thanks so much, Jeff. We reached out to American Airlines to find out their formula for assigning seats and why those middle seats are often filled before other available seats with more space between passengers. We haven't heard back from them yet, but if we do, we'll post their response on our website at pbscharlotte.org. Well, here's a story of perseverance and ingenuity. The first restaurant in Charlotte's Camp North End opened at the start of the pandemic but the owners were determined to make it work. Carolina Impact Sheila Saints takes us inside Lee and Louise, a modern restaurant deeply rooted in history. I ain't just no random dude, this is my place. At Lee and Louise, a modern juke joint, something's always cooking. In the South, um, during segregation times, uh, black people um, would want to go to have fun and let loose after, you know, they get off work and go have some drinks and listen to some good music. Usually it's not food based, so it's modern day because it's a restaurant here. Chef Greg Collier and his business partner and wife Sabrina opened Lee and Louise to bring people together. They named the restaurant after Greg's late sister and grandmother. Well, I felt like it'd be a perfect time to pay homage to someone who, and my sister, we were gonna, I was gonna try to open a restaurant with her at some point. Um, and my granny, she never really got to teach me all the things that she knew about food. So I felt like this would be a great place to kind of honor them. Originally from Memphis, Tennessee, the Colliers moved to Charlotte in 2012. They opened the Yoke Cafe in Rock Hill and later moved the breakfast and lunch spot to the 7th Street Public Market. Then they created a second concept, a Southern inspired restaurant in Charlotte's Camp North End. It became an obvious choice for us after a while because we would come over here, do some pop-ups and we saw they were doing these cool things. They fostered the arts heavy. I like that Camp North End purposely 
wanted to make sure, hey, we're coming into a historically black community. So we're not trying to come in and gentrify it. We want to improve it, employ people that are in the neighborhood. It's like one of those things, like, if you can't cook it in Memphis, you're the one who can't cook it. Greg Collier is a twice James Beard nominated chef. He cooks modern versions of Southern classics that honor the Mississippi River Valley, like a smoked catfish stew. When I just think about food, almost everything that I grew up with comes from New Orleans, um, North Louisiana, it's Mississippi, Memphis, um, a little bit of St. Louis, a little bit of Nashville. So I want to kind of just look at those food ways and center our food there. Colliers have been married 10 years. The restaurant is a union of their cooking and design skills. Tell me about the wall behind us. So behind us, we have our pallet wall. So Camp Northen, where we are, is an industrial warehouse um, type of project. And they had pallets everywhere, everywhere, pallets, pallets, pallets. And I was like, we got to do something with it. We call that a community table. People that normally wouldn't sit at a table together, you're almost forced, you know, to sit and say, hey, you want the community table to open now? The couches are definitely replicas of our grandparents' house. Um, for the bar, like we have the railroad ties as the footstool. Railroad ties um, because a lot of the um, black workers back in like the 30s and 40s used to work on the railroad. So they would come get off work and then come to the juke joint. If you've ever been to Memphis, ever been to Bill Street, there are neon signs down the whole street for several blocks. And so I wanted to bring that aspect here. The Collier spent months getting the restaurant ready to open in mid-March, when the very next day the shelter-in-place restrictions went into effect. They had to come up with a new game plan. I think the first thought was like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? And the next thought was like, we're gonna do what we need to do. They chose a soft launch with takeout only. We always have to pivot. That's That should be our middle name. Like, it should really come before our middle name, Sabrina Pivot Collier, Greg Pivot Collier Jr. And so I feel like this was just another pivot. It was a lot bigger, but it was a pivot. So struggle's really not new to us. Trying to figure out how to make things work is really not new to us. The struggle led to success. People have supported the restaurant from day one. This couple drove an hour from Winston-Salem. But we're always pretty adventurous in choosing where we like to eat, and we figured it was a special occasion, and we thought we'd come down here because everything looks so great. They, all their social media posts are great. I think it makes you definitely want to come eat here. The Colliers also founded the nonprofit Soul Food Sessions, a series of dining events supporting people of color in the culinary arts. Whether it's food or fellowship, Lee and Louise reflects a labor of love. For Carolina Impact, I'm Sheila Saints reporting. Thanks so much, Sheila. Lee and Louise is open Wednesday through Sunday nights for dinner only. Reservations are encouraged. The Colliers are also exploring opening a third concept restaurant. Well, the coronavirus impact has been devastating for businesses and organizations across the country and certainly here in our region. One nonprofit hit hard by the pandemic is the Charlotte YMCA. The pandemic shutdown created system-wide layoffs and massive program cuts. But the institution that has served our region for decades redefined itself and its service. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzis tells us more. In many ways, a visit to the local YMCA looks just like it always has. People doing cardio dances, running on the treadmill, and clearing their mind, body, and spirit with some yoga. Beautiful standing split. Release this, left leg's gonna lift. But as you might expect, there are a lot of things that look quite different these days, like the aerobics classes, outside, in the parking lot. These last eight months have been like nothing I've ever experienced, and I think everybody could probably say that. At the Morrison Family YMCA in Ballantyne, the first thing you'll notice is how you go in, a one-way entrance leading directly to a temperature check station. Hand sanitizing stations are here and just about everywhere. Notices are on closed equipment, and reminder signs for face mask requirements and social distancing are posted. And everyone using weight machines gets their own bottle of disinfectant spray. People are so thankful to be back inside and having an opportunity to kind of have somewhat 
of a sense of normalcy that they have been so respectful and so willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that they can still come back in here. Before COVID hit, the YMCA of Greater Charlotte comprised of 19 locations, employing 4,500 people with some 30,000 members. Well, back in March, obviously things drastically changed. You know, I think in the beginning we were hopeful that we could take some precautionary measures and then it would all get better very quickly, but that's evidently not the case. And so we're trying to prepare ourselves kind of for the long haul of constant change. As we've navigated through this, it's been pretty painful uh, because we've seen a significant drop of over half of our membership. Every single staff person has had a pay cut and we've had about 30% reduction in our full-time team. So what was an employee base of about 4,500 pre-COVID is now between 12 and 1,300. Think Thinking they'd be closed for two weeks, the Y was closed for two and a half months, from mid-March into June. And like many businesses, they had to rethink strategy, get creative, and find new ways of doing things. We pretty much right away just started brainstorming how we're going to make the situation the best as possible for all of our members. What we've said from the very beginning, we knew quickly that we were going to look different on the other side of this, and we do. Uh, the YMCA is uh, going to be a different organization, and that's not all bad. I think there's great opportunity that also exists for us as we serve the community. It started when schools first closed with an anonymous donation to meet childcare needs of essential workers at Novon and Atrium Health. Then slowly, outdoor exercise classes returned, along with summer camps. In early September, the next step, the North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper eased phase two COVID restrictions, allowing gyms to reopen indoors at 30% capacity. Because it was hard, you know, at the end of the day, you didn't know what it was gonna look like when you came back, if you got to come back. The Y then created the School Days Plus program, providing 13 remote learning sites, helping nearly 800 kindergarten through sixth graders navigate their way through remote learning. We're so thankful we can partner with our different school districts right now who, who are really in a tough position as far as how to navigate the educational process with their kids. The first few days were a little bit of a hurdle to get over, but we've, um, we've gotten to the point now where we're getting used to the schedules the teachers are getting to know the kids. Um, our, our room leaders are getting to know our kids' teachers. So this isn't childcare. This is uh, part of an academic day. So you go into the YMCA's, you're not going to hear a lot of yelling and screaming and playing of the kids. They're in school. And, and so this is a real academic experience. At Morrison, 100 kids are in the program but they attend 26 different schools, thereby creating all sorts of challenges. Navigating the logistics of making sure every child's needs are met when it comes to their education um, is a very unique challenge we haven't been faced with before. Despite the layoffs and membership reductions, the Y has been fortunate to land a few major grants to help support programs like School Days Plus, including two big contributions from the city of Charlotte. The city of Charlotte has been an incredible, incredible partner and we were able through a $2 million grant in the summer able to serve youth and teens around youth and teen opportunity and health equity initiatives and we're so thankful for the city because we're going to be able to continue that this fall with another $1.75 million partnership and commitment. For now, the Y, like so many other businesses and organizations, is doing all it can to keep its doors open and continue serving the public. So we feel blessed in one regard that we were able to survive as best we did, but we've been deeply impacted. Honestly, a lot of the population that I think gives us the most compliments are going to be those people that are like in their 60s and up, and that's, that's a population that is at risk. And so to hear that, especially coming from them, has really made me feel good and made me feel like we are taking the right measures. It's still not the ideal situation, but then again, these days, what really is? The Y would love to have all of its staff and members back, but for now at least, this is the reality. This whole crisis, if I'm going to find a silver lining in this, it has really helped us clarify our identity. Um, and we're not a gym and a slim. The YMCA is a community service organization meeting holistic needs of the community for all. It's one of the reasons I love working for the Y because I feel like we're nimble and I feel like our priority is always on the community. Our goal is to get our membership built back up. We think it's going to take a long time, um, but um, we're going to do our best to be community partners and ask the, part, the community to partner with us as we rebuild our YMCA. The goals for the Y in the coming months, the three R's. Recruit new members, retain those that have stayed, and recapture those that have left. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting.
Thanks so much, Jason. The state just awarded more than a million dollars to the YMCA of Greater Charlotte to provide remote learning during this pandemic. Well, Charlotte's legendary bluegrass band, the Briar Hoppers, played together on the radio for the first time in 1934. And today, they're the oldest string band in the world, changing band members over the years, but still together longer than any other band ever, and still playing those old timey tunes that Briar Hopper fans have loved for decades. Y'all know what it is? No, what is it? It's Briar time. That's the same Briar Hopper's ukulele from 85 years ago. Wait till the sunshine nearly. Playing the same song that starts every Briar Hopper show. It's what they played in 1934 when the Briar Hoppers first went on the air. WBT presents Briar Hopper Time. And what they played in 1985, those same Briar Hoppers, live at Spirit Square. Which brings us to these newest members of the oldest string band anywhere. Well, I tried to sail this sea of life, I rode my boat alone. You're How close to today's show is the shows they did back in the 30s. They probably did them better back in the 30s because Crutchfield was doing the announcing. Nobody could announce like he could. By the way, neighbors, if you all would like to have a picture of White and Hogan and Hank and all the rest of the Fry Hoppers, goodness knows why you would, but if you want one. Charlie Crutchfield wasn't just the Briar Hoppers announcer, though. He was the group's founder and finder. All right, hop aboard now, boys. We're gonna take the ride of our lives. Handpicking those homegrown pickers and fiddlers and singers for the Briar Hoppers and all the other groups that were regulars on the Briar Hopper show. Oh yeah, this junk, I mean, uh, these, these fine products sure are good. Were the Briar Hoppers bigger than the Grand Old Opry? At one time, yes. More popular? Probably more popular. I know at the height of their popularity, they were getting between 10 and 15,000 letters a week. And while the current Briar Hoppers are keeping the band's 85-year-old history alive today, well, you've got to come to Merle's Inlet, South Carolina, if you want to hear the Briar Hoppers' history first half from one of the original Briar Hoppers. The Orange Blossom Special. When they played the intro, I'd say, yippee! All aboard! <laughs> Billy Burton Daniel is 95 years old, and while her voice may be weak, her memory's still sharp. Back when she was a teenager, fans everywhere knew her as Billy Briarhopper, sweetheart of the Carolinas, the Carolina Sunshine Girl. She was the make believe Briarhopper daughter of the make-believe Briar Hopper family who became real on the radio every afternoon. I would go into the studio. I got out of school at three mm -hmm. and rode the bus uptown and I uh, got back 3.30. And sometimes I had to learn two songs. You just wanted to sing. I just wanted to sing. Coming down the railroad track. Daniel still remembers getting her first check for $10 a week singing with the Briar Hoppers at a time when her feel-good family on the radio was the only way for listeners to escape the hard times they were feeling in their own families. Nobody had any money. After we played our hour and finished up at 5 o'clock, we would go out on the road and play theaters and schools, and we got to keep all the money we made on the side. And eventually, the Briar Hopper show was so popular in the Carolinas, on stage and on the radio, that Hollywood filmmakers came calling. We went to California and worked in three different movies. One with Little Bell and Scotty, uh, called Swing Your Partner. Party Lou, she swims on the channel. Party Lou, she swims in red flannel. 
These days, there are no movies, Tear off the box top. no Briar Hopper radio show. The audiences are smaller, the concerts are fewer, but 85 years later, on the altar of this old Charlotte church, the music of the Briar Hoppers and the spirit of the Briar Hoppers still echo. Some glad There's so much history here. You know, you've had weddings and funerals and revivals. And so you've got all of that still vibrating in the floorboards. And you're up there playing and you still feel those vibrations in your feet. A lot of spirits. And you hope that when you play as a Briar Hopper, you hope that the spirits of the old Briar Hoppers are around you. It just felt so natural. Mm -hmm. And the people were so nice. I just wish I could go back. I wish, when I think about it now, it's like a movie I saw a long time ago that I want to see again. Thanks so much, Jeff. This year, the Briar Hoppers were also named to the North Carolina Music Hall of Fame. If you're a Passport member, you can also watch PBS Charlotte's living history documentary, Country in the Carolinas, where the Briar Hoppers were featured. That's all we have time for this evening, my friends. Thanks so much for joining us. We always appreciate your time, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night. A production of PBS Charlotte.